once we formulate the Layton Rao relaxation as a linear program, that we can find an optimum solution through a linear programming solver. And this will give us a collection of uh, distances, one for each uh, pair of vertices, which minimizes this ratio. And now, given this distance function, we would like to find um, a cut of uh, small sparsity. If, for example, our input graph G is a cycle and the graph H is a click, then the solution to the linear program will be a distance function that up to a constant is just the shortest path distance between uh, pairs of vertices. Well, given a distance between pairs of points of this form, how do we go about finding a cut in the graph? Because a cut is something that assigns a Boolean value to every vertex. So it's something that it's natural to think of as being a function of vertices. While the distances that we get out of the Lidon Rao relaxation define a function of uh, pairs of vertices. So we will show how to bridge this gap between cuts being functions of vertices and distance functions being functions of uh, pairs of vertices in uh, two steps. The first step, which is also the hardest step, is to show that given any distance function that satisfies the triangle inequality, in particular given the distance function that is optimal for the leton rao relaxation, it's possible to map vertices to real vectors in such a way that if we use the L1 distance between uh, those vectors, the corresponding ratio is off from uh, what it would be for the original distance function by only a order of log n approximation factor. And then the second step will be to show that given any mapping of uh, vertices to vectors, it's possible to find uh, a cut such that the sparsity of the cut is at most what the cost of the L1 distance function between those vectors would have been in the leton rao relaxation. So once we have those two facts together, then we can combine them to say that this is at most uh, order of uh, log n times eh over eg times this ratio. That's just the cost of d as a solution of the leton rao relaxation. If we do that for the optimal d, this will be times uh, lrgh. But then this is a relaxation, so it's at most the uh, order of log n times the sparsity of the instance gh. Both steps will be constructive and polynomial time computable. The optimal solution is also polynomial time computable. And so overall, this gives us a polynomial time algorithm that finds a cut whose sparsity is at most order of log n times the optimal sparsity. We will prove these two statements, starting from the second, which is a bit easier, and has a proof that is very similar to the proof of the Chigar inequality. First of all, let me remind you what's the definition of the L1 norm. If we have two vectors, the L1 distance between f and g is just the summation over the coordinates of the difference of the vectors in those coordinates. So, for example, the vector 3, 1 and the vector 2, 2 have L1 distance 2. Because 1 is the difference between the y coordinates and 1 is also the difference between the x coordinates. So, the L2 distance is 2. Well, remember the definition of the sparsity of a um, sparse cut instance gh is up to normalizing factor, the minimum of all cuts, which can equivalently be represented as Boolean vectors, of uh, the number of g edges that cross the cut, which can be written this way, divided by the number of uh, h edges that cross the cut, which can be written this way. What we are going to prove is that this quantity is the same if uh, instead of optimizing overall Boolean vectors, 
which we can see as assignments of uh, a value from 0, 1 to each vertex. We optimize over arbitrary mappings that map vertices to arbitrarily dimensional vectors. And then we replace the absolute value of the difference by the L1 norm. So this would correspond to functions f that map every vertex to just uh, a one-dimensional vector, so just a real number, which is further constrained to be either 0 or 1. And in the case, this would be the L1 distance between uh, two one-dimensional vectors. So this is a huge generalization, uh, but still the optimum doesn't change. Here is how we prove it. If we have some arbitrary mapping of vertices into vectors, we can write the vector corresponding to vertex v as the vector f1v, f2v, fmv, where each of those are just real numbers. Then, both in the numerator and the denominator of uh, this ratio, this L1 distance can be written as the summation of uh, the differences of the various coordinates of uh, fu and fe. And then just by changing the order of summation, we get something like this. Now remember that in the proof of the difficult direction of the Chigger inequality, we proved something that has a slightly different form but is equivalent to this fact. The if ai and bi are uh, non-negative numbers, then the ratio between the summation of the ai and the summation of the bi is at least the minimum uh, ratio. When you apply this fact here, you can take the ai is to be each of those terms and the bi is to be each of those terms. And so you get that this ratio is at least uh, this ratio when you pick the minimal i. And this means that we can move from mappings that map vertices to high dimensional vectors to mappings that map vertices to just uh, real numbers and the quality of the solution can only increase. So let's call i star the coordinate for which this ratio is minimal. And so now we have a one dimensional mapping, one that maps vertex v to fi star of v and for which this ratio is only better than what it was before. And also, since the ratio doesn't change if we multiply every entry fi star v by the same constant, we may assume that the range of uh, the function fi star, the difference between the maximum and the minimal value that it takes over all vertices, is precisely 1. Given that, we're going to pick a threshold at random in the range of uh, fi star. Again, remember how similar this is to what we did in the Chigger inequality, except that here, since we are working with L1 norm instead of uh, the square of the L2 norm, we can just pick t uniformly, while there we had to pick t with a strange distribution that guaranteed that the probability of t falling in a certain range was proportional to the square of uh, the range. And then again, as in the proof of the Chigger inequality, we define uh, st to be the set of vertices for which fsrv is more than t. This will be a random variable whose randomness depends on the choice of t. Then continuing with the analogy of the proof of the Chigger inequality, we can look at what is the expected number of uh, edges of g that are cut by the partition as t, v minus st. And what is the expected number of uh, h edges that are cut by the partition? And then we see that this will just be the summation over the edges of the probability that the edge is cut, and that this probability will be the probability that the threshold is in the interval between whichever is smaller and whichever is larger of uh, fi star u and fi star v. And so the probability will be precisely this difference in absolute value. And again, as in a proof of the Chigger inequality, we can say that there must be some threshold t, such that the ratio for uh, that set t is at most as big as the ratio of the averages. So this will be at most the ratio of the averages, and so it will be at most uh, this expression. And in turn, remember, this expression was at most uh, this expression. So after normalization, what we have here is the sparsity 
for the input GH of the cut ST V minus ST. And uh, what we have here is the cost of uh, the distance function FU minus FV in L1. Remember, this ratio was at most this ratio. So after normalization, after multiplying by the number of edges in H divided by the number of uh, edges in G, this becomes the sparsity of uh, the cut ST. And this becomes the upper bound that we were looking for, the expression that we claimed here. Let's now see a concrete example. Suppose that we have a graph G, which is just a six cycle. And suppose that the graph H is just made of uh, these two edges. And suppose we're given the following mapping of uh, vertices into two dimensional vectors. This is a mapping where a is mapped to the 0, 0 point, B is mapped to a point of coordinates 1, 0, C is mapped to a point of coordinates 2, 1, D is mapped to a point of uh, coordinates 2, 3, and then E is mapped to a point of coordinates 1, 2, and uh, F is mapped to a point of coordinates 0, 2. Now we want to see what is the ratio between uh, the summation over all the edges of G of the L1 distance between uh, the points to which the endpoints of the edge are mapped, divided by the summation over the edges of H of uh, the same expression. And this can be computed to be 10 divided by 9. Now we claim that either by taking the first coordinate of the mapping f or by taking the second coordinate of the mapping f, we can get a one-dimensional mapping for which this ratio will be at most 10 over 9. Well, if we look at the first coordinate, we get this mapping of uh, the vertices to the real line. a and f are mapped to 0, e and b are mapped to 1, and uh, c and d are mapped to 2. So this is the mapping corresponding to the first coordinates. In the mapping corresponding to the second coordinates, to the y-axis, we have a and b mapped to 0, c mapped to 1, and if we compute what is the ratio just for uh, this one-dimensional mapping of the summation over the edges of G of the difference between the endpoints divided by the summation over the edges of H of the distances between the endpoints, for uh, this coordinate, we get the ratio 4 over 3. And for this mapping, we get the ratio 6 over 6. Notice that 10 over 9 is the ratio of uh, 6 plus 4 divided by 6 plus 3, and that one of those two ratios is more than 10 over 9. In particular, 6 over 6, which is 1, is better than 10 over 9. This means that we are going to work with uh, this one-dimensional mapping to get an actual cut of the graph. And the cuts that we will consider will be all those that we can get by picking a threshold in this one-dimensional mapping. So we're going to look at the cut where A, B are on one side and C, F, E, D are on the other side. The cut where one side is A, B, C and the other is F, E, D. And then the cut A, B, C, F, E with D on the other side. And if we compute what is the sparsity without the normalization factor for uh, each of uh, those three cuts, those will all be 2 over 2. So in fact, either of them will have sparsity at most 1. And so this sparsity will be at most uh, 10 over 9, which was the ratio that we started from.